Hello, so welcome everyone to Research Insights with Elite Mind Academy. So these are live weekly conversations where I'm Evelina and my colleague Valentina are sharing research insights about organizational well-being that often stay behind the closed doors. So today we are talking about communication strategy and why our social relationships are so important for our health, well-being, but also for our performance at work. So Valentina, hello. Would you like to introduce us a little bit more into the, today's topic and what we are going to cover? Absolutely. Hello and welcome everyone who's tuning in. Um, so today we are exactly like you say, looking at communication strategy, but we're not thinking about communication strategy in terms of our external or promotional communications. We're thinking about communication within the organization, so internal relationships. Um, and we are going to be looking at how our social relationships affect our health and our experiences of health issues. Um, and how that can also affect our outcomes with health issues. So how we uh, access support and, and how that's affected by our social relationships. Um, we will also be looking at how our social relationships and having good, strong, working, personal and professional relationships at work can produce better outcomes at work. So more profit, uh, higher efficiency. Um, and we are also then going to explore, okay, so if we, we know this, then how do we implement good communication so that we have strong working relationships, strong personal relationships at work? What kinds of techniques and strategies can be useful, but what are the pitfalls of those and what might some alternatives be? Yeah, so as you can hear, there's plenty of useful, meaty uh, takeaways uh, that we're going to cover. But I think before we get into all the nitty gritty of that, maybe what would be interesting to um, introduce is why we have chosen this topic, right? And I think this is really comes from, from you know, our work um, in as, as a consultant when we're working with organizations, um, we go in to help companies to build their well-being strategy. And the first thing that we always look at is communication within organization, right? So what are the reporting lines? What are the communication channels? You know, what, uh, what are um, skills that people have to be able to build and maintain those social relationships? What, how, how is this community and the culture of the business being maintained through the way we communicate with each other? And it very often, you know, we get some odd looks back and people say, well, what does, what does communication strategy have to do with the well-being strategy? And obviously everything. <laughs> it really sits at the core of your well-being strategy. And you cannot build the right support. You cannot build healthy organization. You cannot uh, drive growth and achieve results if you don't have uh, established ways of communicating clearly and establishing some of those trusting relationships in the business that then drive people uh, people's well-being, but also business performance. So it's really, really key message for you to take away that we, we really need to... <laughs> Um, highlight this importance of, of the communication strategy for the organization. And it's not just, you know, active listening skills and, uh, and knowing how to be friendly and respectful to each other. Um, but it really goes much deeper because we really need to look at systemizing our communications, right? And, and looking at um, providing very clear guidelines in terms of how people communicate officially, but then also how can we create some of those social hubs of interactivity and and build those uh, uh, those activities where people can come together and really talk and open up and build that trust and and support network for themselves. So, um, yeah. Certainly. And I think kind of as the context for this, so I'll kind of go into a little bit just about how our social relationships can affect our health um, and our experience of other symptoms. Um, so there's a lot of research, there's multiple studies, and we can link some of those in the comments. And I, I believe there's also some linked in a previous session that we did about um, social prescribing. Um, but there's a lot of research to say that having strong social relationships 
positively impacts your health in a very far reaching way. So regardless of what your health issue is, a, having strong social relationships will better your experience of that. So it will lessen some of the symptoms and could improve your outcomes. And some of that comes down to, uh, you know, having distractions. And, you know, if you're more socially isolated, you have a lot of time on your hands to really fixate and focus on things that are going wrong. Um, but also things like reducing stress levels and uh, giving a feeling of belonging and a sense of um, a sense of support. So uh, with a lot of health issues as well, we will talk to our peers about them before we go to a health professional. Um, and actually having that support within our peer network can end up meaning that we don't actually end up needing to go to a health professional because we might receive some advice, guidance and support within our social relationships that then mean that actually that has met our need and has supported our health in that way. Um, and also things like when we look at something like stress, uh, that is the kind of thing that having good social relationships can have a really dramatic effect on. And stress as an experience or an emotion um, negatively influences or exacerbates the vast majority of existing health difficulties no matter what they are. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of context just about how having good social relationships can support your health generally. When we look at that in the context of work then having being able to talk to your colleagues about what is stressful at work also means that they learn more about what you're experiencing in your role and it also means that then overall stress is reduced for everyone involved um, because of this ability to talk about it hear other perspectives and feel supported um, but if we don't have those kinds of relationships at work and we can, you know, this can be talking about things that are stressful in our work environment, but can also be talking about things that are stressful in our home environment um, or outside of work generally. Um, but if, so if we don't have those stronger personal relationships at work, then we don't talk so much and share so much about our experience and especially our emotional experience of what might be going on in a working environment, but also what might be going on outside of that. And when we don't have that understanding and that connection with one another, then we're much more likely to have conflicts. We're much more likely to have a breakdown of relationships, lower retention rates and things like this, which obviously negatively impact uh, efficiency and cost, it cost money. Yes, and I'm really glad that you're mentioning, you know, all of the stresses that we are facing at work, but also in personal lives and the importance of having that healthy outlet to reach out for support and actually talk about it because very often things that we are uh, dealing with uh, feels very big uh, until we actually open up and share about that and we realize that there is so many different things that we can do to address this and we very often see this um, you know let's say employers do your engagement you do let's say your engagement surveys you want to check in with people you know how they feel and stress usually is one of the biggest drivers of why people are not happy at work right it's either pressures at work are really affecting their personal lives but also other way around some personal uh, life stresses are not being considered in how that now affects individuals' experience at work. So facilitating some of those healthy connections and being able to communicate about that is really crucial. So the question here is how do we do this in a right way? And you know, we can give a lot of examples when this is not happening and we can probably break that down to, to highlight some issues uh, when, when things are creating risks in the way we're expecting people to co communicate, right? One of the things um, that we see is in the communication uh, policies and your reporting lines, very often we say that your line manager is the first point of communication. And if you have any concerns, your line manager is supposed to be the, the first person to talk to. 
And this is not right because <laughs> very often your boss is not the best person to support you in, in that way, but also it's the person who will then make decisions about your, um, your promotions, about your workload, about um, really shaping your experience at work. So there are a lot of things that they need to know, but also just by nature of it, if, you, if I'm now going to my direct line manager and I'm sharing the fact that I'm, you know, uh, experiencing some difficulties in my personal life, most likely that person will exclude us from, let's say, promotions, or maybe they will reduce the workload. And with their best intentions, they will do the best that they can. It's They're not always the expert in, in doing this in the right way. So it's very important that we understand the difference between what support do I need from this manager and how we can communicate it in the right way. But opening up about your personal struggles, about your personal issues, is not always the best um, way to go about by needing to report to your line manager. And very often, um, many companies have this kind of nearly this barrier that in order to get any other support, in, in order to, to be referred to some other um psychological support maybe and so on you have to have kind of need to go through your line manager to get this so the the best thing that we we recommend to do is definitely having that completely confidential outlet that people can talk about their struggles at work in a way that is not linked with their daily job performance and it's not going through their line manager because those things are different in many ways and it's really important to help people compartmentalize that this is my work, this is my performance, this is my emotional well-being, this is how I am and of course one thing affects another but we need to be able to separate our approaches for support that we are providing for person's mental health and for their performance in a very different ways. So th those communication lines are very, very important. Um, yeah, I don't know, Valentina, if you want to comment something yeah. on that. Absolutely. I think you raise a really good point there in how our communication is directed in these very narrow tunnels or channels often. Um, you know, through a hierarchy, which is, like you say, it's it, it ends up um, kind of meaning that there's too much of a crossover in terms of our communications about our emotional well-being and our communications about the content of our work, um, which means that we often hide things that we think are going to affect our chances of promotion or might uh, show us in a light that might make us look as though we aren't as capable in certain areas um, or might have difficulties in other areas. Um, and being able to have something, a uh, channel, a person, a group, whatever means to talk about your emotional life within the context of work will help someone feel supported, safe and kind of belonging within their work environment and foster good relationships with the other people who are also in that space. Um, but it keeps it separate from these concerns, which can then, you know, in terms of uh, speaking with your line manager, because of the concern around how that will impact your progression and your work, maybe your salary, things like that. Um, and there are lots of, so when we think about how this gets enacted, um, there's a lot of informal ways in which we make these connections with other people and we have that space within our working environment to talk about what's going on for us emotionally. Um, and there are some more formal ways in which we do that. Um, there are pros and cons to both. Uh, and I wonder if, yeah, maybe now's a good time to start talking about some of those spaces. Yeah, and you've mentioned as well uh, the fact that many people are actually hiding some sort of health issues from their employers. So there's been a um, study and stats that we shared uh, recently in, in our company page. 
And 40% 40 of people are hiding health concern from their managers. So, so if you think about that, <laughs> that's a huge number of people that are hiding some sort of health concern. And, you know, why they do that? Well, first of all, there is a fear that this will negatively affect their um, experience at work, such as, you know, they will be excluded from promotions, maybe the, the treatment that they are received from their peers and from, from their uh, colleagues, managers will be, will be very different. And the truth is that those, um, those fears are not um, unfounded, right? There are really, really a lot of research showing that there is so much discrimination towards people who are uh, especially living with long-term chronic conditions. And the opportunities that these people are being excluded from are, are really unacceptable, right? And we have to do something about this. So, of course, how can we include people in the right way? How can we make them heard? And, and here is this balance, right, that if people are are hiding concerns from us, how do we support them in the right way? So we want to include our people in decision making. We want to hear from them when we are considering uh, what support and well-being initiatives we're supposed to be providing at work. But of course, if your employers are hiding that information from you, how can you? You know, how can you really create this um, in a right way? And I think that's also another reason why, why we are offering now these confidential, impartial employee surveys, because there are huge benefits in having um, third party to come in and open up those conversations and, and keep whatever they want to keep uh, privately, and yet still have those messages heard at, um, at the leadership level. Certainly, and that's why, you know, having... Uh, yeah, accessing impartial employee needs assessments for kind of a more thorough look at the employee experience. Um, but also having those channels like we were talking about before of that confidential reporting, you know, if you've experienced some discrimination at work, you might have experienced that from your line manager or you just might not feel like your line manager understands as an example and so to have some kind of confidential way of reporting that not only makes a difference to the actual environment as long as that report is responded to um, in a practical way um, but it also just helps somebody to feel that there is a route to speak about their experience and that their experience is valuable rather than always uh, kind of having this or having more of a one-way stream of conversation or communication it's opening up more of a dialogue and a comfortable one where employees can talk about negative experiences in their workplace mm -hmm. and that not uh, create a defensive reaction from the organization, but actually one that is proactive, responsive, empathetic and, and listening. Um, and I think as well, when we're thinking about initiatives to engage people socially, there's we also need to think about the accessibility of those initiatives. So like you say, Evelina, for people who are experiencing long-term chronic health conditions, how many of the, say, social events that you organize are accessible to somebody in that situation? Also, are they, you know, how many of the social events that you organize are reflective of cultural tradition, the cultural traditions of the people who are working for you or who you, you would like to be working for you? How many of the internal communications recognize like difficulty around say sensory processing um, and things like that. So really with this, I think it's also very important that uh, diversity, equity and inclusion strategy overlaps and is embedded into communication strategy because it's often those people who are facing barriers within the workplace because of insufficient accessibility um, with regards to communication and participating in social engagement um, that will be having the most negative time and the most difficult time which is yeah un unacceptable really in terms of kind of an inequality of experience there. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think definitely when we look at, you know, the, the importance of making those communications accessible, inclusive, and also some of the initiatives that we're putting out there, um, making sure that we are communicating about those initiatives as well as we've seen many organizations who say, oh, you know, we've uh, created this wonderful initiative uh, for people based on specifically on what they have asked. You know, they asked for this topic, they asked for the support, and now we put that uh, event out there, realize that people are not engaging and we don't understand why. And when we kind of pull <laughs> layers back, we understand that people didn't actually even know that that is happening because the way it was being communicated didn't reach those specific people who needed it the most. Okay. And, and that's, I guess, the, 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 the example of, of, of really or the importance of communicating with the right audiences in the right way. And also then measuring the engagement based on, on who needs it. Right. And I think sometimes we put this kind of a standard blanket approach to say, right, you know, we decided that we're going to roll this this initiative, this well-being initiative. And, you know, our success, the ideal would be, let's say, you know, 100 percent engagement rates, right, that everyone is engaging. And there is this huge problem of people not engaging with well-being initiatives. But the reason for that is because one is they're not personalized to individual needs. But second is that it's not communicated in a right way to those specific people who really need it the most. So it's so, so crucial to align all of our communication strategy to make to make the best out of our um, communication initiatives. But anyway, I think that aside, let's look beyond well-being initiatives. Let's look beyond our um, programs that we are putting out and, and the way we're communicating about Let's look at the broader context of how to drive healthy relationships and healthy communications at work in general. And here we see, again, there are these very common issues of building relationships uh, or establishing sometimes the right relationships and creating the right results, but doing it in the wrong way. So, for example creating social events that are all surrounded by alcohol, um, having, you know, extra space and time for people who smoke to go outside and, and exchange, you know, their ideas and have a conversations. But it's not a healthy way <laughs> to promote healthy relationships, right? So, Valentina, is there anything that you want to share there? And um, I'd love to hear from anyone who's listening how do you promote social engagement at work? What are some of your initiatives that your employers are putting out, that you are putting out for your employees to really drive some of these uh, social connections and, and build those social relationships? We'd love to see some examples. And what do you see that works well? And what are some of these examples that doesn't work well and that actually excludes certain people from some of those activities and initiatives? So feel free to, to share and comment. So with the uh, kind of looking at some of these practices of like social events or work socials often center around alcohol. And I think it's important, we have to look at what the pros are with that. So the pros are that alcohol reduces inhibitions. People are often then more open and might disclose things that they otherwise wouldn't if they weren't inebriated. Um, and that they might feel safer in that context because they're, you know, everybody is doing the same thing. Um, and I think we have to look at that in a way, so we think, okay, so what's useful here? The outcome is the lowered social inhibitions. That can be achieved without alcohol, and there are other ways that we can do that in terms of influencing the environment and making it more psychologically safe. Um, so having, doing workshops and certain kinds of practices where we are encouraged to be more open and to, to access and understand what's going on for us internally and share things with each other bit by bit so that we create a standard of openness. Um, and actually what we often see is that 
when there's one or two people who are more extroverted, lively, sociable, open, without the need for alcohol, that though or those people act as a catalyst for others within that social group to then also be more open and also be more uh, extroverted and make more connections with people. So understanding those dynamics can really help us foster good social relationships through initiatives that don't necessarily rely on those same tools of using alcohol. And also talking about the practice of going outside smoking, it's, you know, if we look at actually what is useful about that, there's a separate space it's outside so it's physically located outside of the office in a different space uh and that creates a psychological boundary but also a physical boundary and so we can try and replicate that have a space that is only for socializing that you are welcome to go to smoker or not smoker for five minutes 10 minutes however long you need if you just need a bit of a break and you just want to have the feelings of going outside for a cigarette, let's say, and just having the break and time to yourself or time to engage with your colleagues outside of work um, and cons really constructing those spaces so that they're conducive to that and also giving people the levels of trust that they can just take five minutes when they need to to go and use that space because it will benefit their mm -hmm. overall experience of work and their overall productivity. And the other thing is with uh, events or kind of socializing outside of work, thinking about alternatives to alcohol-based activities, um, there's a lot of things that also generate those closer social connections. So playing on a sports team, for example, means that you break a lot of social boundaries in terms of sometimes just movement and physical touch, the clothes that you're wearing even, those little things do make a difference to kind of uh, reduce inhibitions in a social group um, and it also means that then people are engaging physically producing endorphins and things like that that make us feel better and reduce stress um, that also has that positive effect on our experience of work and our well-being more widely so that there's kind of a couple of examples there but there's uh, I think the main thing is to when we notice that there's an existing practice that is working to foster good social relationships but has a negative element to it is to ask, okay, but what makes it positive and see if you can achieve that through other means. I really, really like that because I think very often we, throughout the culture, through the way we are engaging in the organization, we will already have certain things that just simply work in whatever way employees find their own ways to connect, to interact, and looking at it, what exactly about this that works? How exactly this creates the results uh, of connection and, and support and um, having those boundaries from work and life and having this kind of safe space um, to, to, to go to, how can we replicate them in, in healthy ways? And um, very crucial part here is creating shared experiences. Um, is there anything else that we can do to facilitate this shared engagement of these kind of safe, impartial spaces for people to hang out kind of within work, but not related to, to work activities and, um, and, and your, um, your work tasks? So definitely, uh, we see from, from our surveys that, that we are doing, um, a lot of people are referring to need for that safe space provided by the workplace. And I think here as well, there is this misconception that employers don't necessarily want to take on the responsibility saying, well, we don't want to become therapists, right? We need to do our jobs. And yet now, how do we support people in the right way? So, oh, let's the, just give them, you know, a, a number to Samaritans. Let's just refer them uh, to some external support systems. And most often we see that people are not really using it because most of those support outlets that are being referred to, they are not in any how different to what they could Google <laughs> and find on, you know, publicly on internet, right? So if someone is coming to work um, and bringing that concern to their employers, to their colleagues, how do we not send them back? 
right? And this is, I think it's a crucial point to really look at what support ecosystems we are creating and, and how much of that support we can do internally and how much of that support needs to happen externally. But the way we refer people to those external support options is not just something generic that, you know, they could get anyway, right? Like sending person to a GP or giving them some Samaritan's number is it's equivalent to no support because this is something that they are aware of and they have already, right? Certainly. And I think also just what's worth mentioning there is, you know, even with certain employee assistance programs, to then it's still sending someone externally, even though it's maybe a therapist. And you know, I think that, you know, having access to those that kind of support through work is really, really important. So I'm definitely not saying that uh, that those things aren't worthwhile but they don't cover this issue. And this issue is about good communication and strong relationships at work. And by consistently sending people away from work to external bodies and to external services to work on things like stress or you know, a difficulty with relationships, that it's not, you know, it's not changing the actual environment that they were going to need to practice these skills and these relationships in. Yeah, and it's kind of shedding the responsibility away from from our organization and not really wanting to own the issues that actually maybe we have created for this person at work. And the good example of, of that, when we see, let's say, employers reporting being stressed at work because of the work workload and because of the pressures, uh, work-related pressures, the way employers tend to support that, oh, let's just, you know, give you some stress resilience uh, workshop, or let's just give you some sort of, um, you know, library resources to build your resilience for stress so you can cope better with it, right? What are we doing here, right? He's saying <laughs> we, are, we, we have created this problem of stress and pressure and we are not willing to do anything about it we put it back onto the individual and say well you know here's some resources for you to cope better with whatever level of stress we are we're building instead of actually looking at can we create those healthier outlets can we improve our ways of working can we find a way to reduce some of those pressures and create those support ecosystems where we don't necessarily have to pay an external provider to come and deliver training for resilience, but you can reduce the pressure in the right way internally. And some of the best examples are these safe spaces created internally where people can come together and talk about work-related issues and actually work through them together because people don't want to just kind of complain for the sake of complaining, right? They also want to give to be given an authority to do something about it. And that can be a really, really powerful message to give back to, to say, don't bring us complaints, bring us solutions. And we want to hear from you. You know, we want to see what can we do about addressing some of those issues that we are having and creating those safe spaces to communicate about it, to, 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 to resolve some of those concerns in, in a creative way. And, um, yeah, some, some of those best examples are, let's say, trust circles that are being created to discuss specific concerns, uh, topic groups that are, let's say, led by ambassadors, you know, talking about mental health or about neurodiversity issues or about productivity or, again, spaces for... Um, for extroverts, right? Where do they go? Because, you know, very often some of those social initiatives are created in a way that excludes people who wouldn't necessarily be going into some of those activities. So how can we create specific activities for them where they can interact? And let's say some of those good examples could be uh, playing games together doing something interactive together and that's the reason why people will come together but as they are already spending time doing things together just by nature of it of course people will talk and open up because they're spending time with the same group of people you know potentially uh, on regular basis that builds trust that builds those connections and that creates that safety for someone to then open up and say how are you today 
right? And and share that maybe I'm not okay today, and something else happened that that is playing on my mind, and and I'm and I'm glad to be here. So really looking at those safe spaces, um, shared experiences, and finding a way to build trust and connection in a meaningful way, in a way that is inclusive to everyone and in the way that is communicated to everyone in a way that will reach them. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's another thing that's quite important to remember with this is that with these initiatives, they it needs to be embedded within the culture that it's important and that the organization values them because sorry excuse me (coughs) because um often if when people have high workloads if they are offered an option to participate in say a trust cycle a lot of people are going to see that and think what a waste of time. I've got so much to do. I'm better off reducing my stress by just doing my work and getting ahead. And so these initiatives need to be embedded within the working structure. So yes, reducing people's workload so that they have time and this is in their calendars within working hours so that it's not something that then ends up being, again, a personal and individual responsibility rather than the organization taking responsibility for it. And the other thing is that those activities need to be congruent with different identities. So, for example, going, you know, uh, someone who is into well-being and is kind of emotionally open might be quite happy to go to a trust circle. A lot of people will hear that and think that is not congruent with my identity. I they might hold more masculine identities or there might be parts of cultural identities that just that does not resonate with and and they can't connect. So understanding actually what your employees hear when they hear about these activities is really important. And also finding things that people that are already within the habits and language of the people that you're serving. So what are people already doing as their hobbies? So if somebody reads a lot, maybe they you can have a book club. If there's cooking and sharing food from your culture, I mean, that's the kind of thing, having shared lunches where mm-hmm. people get to bring in a dish from their culture, talk about, uh, you know, recipes, how you make it, um, what it means, any if there's any significance to it, the kinds of times that you might have that food. All of these things can be really, really useful initiatives to actually just meet people where they're at and things that they're already doing and extrapolate that to include it within the workspace in a safe and um, in a safe way that is uh seen and understood as valuable by the organization because time and space has been created for it rather than that being an additional load to an individual um when most likely they already have a high workload yeah, absolutely. So I guess to summarize, I think it's so important to recognize that the way we communicate within the organization and the way we create those safe spaces have a huge, huge effect on, on people's well-being, but even physical health as well, and, and can really create um, outlets to cope better with, with external pressures and, um, and, and stresses um, at work. And the way to do it right is knowing the boundaries between how much we need to be doing internally and where we need to uh, refer people for external support, but always prioritizing the internal support first and never just kind of shedding that responsibility away, always looking at what we can do to prevent this issue from happening. You know, if somebody raises concern, how did that came about? And, and what are some of the things that we can do strategically in our ways of working to, to address those? And building these shared spaces, safe spaces for people internally to come together, have those shared experiences, have a way to, to communicate and build those relationships on, on, on a common ground. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, here is your support group where you come and talk about mental health it could be hey let's you know have uh, play football together let's let's have some other i don't know gaming room let's let's go to movies together let's have a book club so whatever that might be that can help to bring this 
sense of community and belonging is really, really useful before we start digging deeper into, into the actual, you know, reporting lines, organizational structure, you know, who is the first person you will go to when you're not feeling well, and really mapping it out into this kind of ecosystemic way to really understand if this person needs support, what are they likely to do? And, you know, do we have support ecosystem for every person and a safe outlet for every um, kind of individual or, or, or a type of identity uh, in a way that speaks to, to them and it's, and it's relevant for, for their, to address their needs. Certainly. So kind of, yeah, just to echo that, it's having initiatives that are really understanding your employee population and actually what they need and what they'll engage with, uh, rather than um, kind of essentially saying, well, this is what we're going to do. And if you want to engage with it, then great. But if you don't want to, then that's your choice. Actually understanding what influences that choice. And that's your responsibility as an organization to learn from. And inevitably, it will end up benefiting the organization as a whole because relationships will be better. Um, and I just wanted to take a minute just at the end here to kind of thank people who have been engaging in the comments. Um, really kind of nice things here to say about how you know good social relationships benefit us at work as a preventative medicine I really like that phrasing and I think that that makes a big difference um, and also saying uh, from Jay we're social beings and so fostering better social connections in work is the lifeblood of organizational citizenship um, which I think is also really important when we especially in our uh, hyper individualized society we need to feel like we belong to different groups and feeling a sense of organizational citizenship it can be a really important part of that um, and Rob says about having something in the calendar is vitally important and how lunchtime can be such a valuable experience when it's shared. Absolutely. So I think this is probably a nice message to end on and making sure that we find ways to include, build relationships and make those social activities not just something outside of work and, and something that uh, we can refer people to, but really embed this in our ways of working into our strategy in our daily calendars so so it becomes part of your work uh, in that way so thank you very much and thank you everyone who's listening if you would like any help um, understanding your employee needs if you need any help building your communication strategy and setting up some of those support ecosystems please do reach out to us uh, because we have an opportunity now to offer free support as part of a research program. So feel free to reach out and we can share more details with you to see if you're eligible for this uh, research partnership. So have a lovely day and enjoy the rest of your week and we'll speak to you next week. Thank you everyone, goodbye.